Are we ready? Yep, okay. we're all ready. Okay, good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the most recent Supreme Court term review. Uh, this term of the Supreme Court made historic decisions, um, one of which was to hear oral arguments through teleconference and to broadcast the hearings live to the public. The court heard cases about LGBTQ worker protections under the Civil Rights Act, deferred action for childhood arrivals, the DACA program, or cases on abortion, several cases dealing with religious entities and federal anti-discrimination laws, contraceptive coverage, uh, schools, uh, state school subsidy programs. Um, court heard arguments about congressional subpoenas and the president's financial records that have uh, implications for both branches of, of government. It also considered uh, Native American land rights and a host of environmental issues. And to make sense out of all these cases, I'm pleased that we have our presenter, Steve Laddick, a professor at law at the University of Texas School of Law and a nationally recognized expert on federal courts, constitutional law, national security law, and military justice. He's argued many cases before the Supreme Court and lower federal courts. He served as an expert witness in both US and foreign tribunals. He's a co-host together with um, uh, Bobby Chesney, another professor at, um, uh, at, at, at the law school. Uh, the uh, popular, uh, the podcast is National Security Law Podcast, NSL Podcast. He is an um, analyst for um, CNN for the Supreme, for Supreme Court issues, uh, co-author of Aspen's Publishers Leading National Security Law and Counterterrorism Law Casebook. He's also the co-editor-in-chief of Just Security Blog and senior editor of Lawfare Blog. He previously taught at the American University Washington School of Law, where when he was there, he gave periodic updates to us uh, on the Supreme Court and uh, for many years. And uh, we haven't heard from him since he left town, which is about four years ago. So we're glad somebody thought we could get him back. So um, thank you, Steve, for being with us. And before we begin, uh, if you uh, raise your hand in the chat box, or the presenters uh, participants list, if you raise your hand, uh, we'll recognize you for questions uh, when after uh, Steve makes his presentation. But with that, Steve, it's great to have you back. And uh, so what happened in the Supreme Court? Yeah, it's quite a term, Congressman. Thank you so much for having me back. I, I miss you. Um, and I miss I miss being around DC, although not as much as maybe I might have had had things gone differently. Um, so it was really it, it was a remarkable term in a number of respects. And what I'd like to do is actually spend a few minutes talking about some of the big overarching themes of the term before getting into specific cases. Um, so just off the top, the court decided um, 53 argued cases. So there were 53 decisions in cases that received full briefing and argument. Um, that's the lowest total since 18, not a typo, 62. Um, part of that, of course, was related to the coronavirus. I mean, this was the term where the court suspended its March and April argument sessions. Um, and as the Congressman said, where it had the first ever telephonic arguments in the court's history for 10 cases in May. But even if the court had heard all of the cases it was scheduled to, still would have been continuing this trend where the court is hearing closer to the low 60s in argued cases each year compared to as recently as 10, 15 years ago when that number was in the high 80s, 25, 30 years ago, that number was in the low 100. So we're seeing this continuing downward trend. Um, also, because of the coronavirus, we had the court going as late into the summer as it's gone since 1974. Um, the last decisions the court handed down, at least in argued cases, came on July 9th. Uh, that was really late. I think it actually is going to have an effect also on the next term because there's usually a flow to how the court operates. There's a slowdown over the summer. The justices sort of recharge their batteries. It really hasn't happened this year. Um, and that sort of leads to the third theme, which is you know, I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about decisions in argued cases, these high profile cases, but we've really seen the rise, especially this term, of something called the shadow docket. Um, this is basically all of the stuff the Supreme Court is doing other than these big argued cases with big decisions. So we've seen over the summer, for example, orders in COVID cases from Nevada, um, from California. We've seen election cases like the 
Florida pay to vote case. Um, we've seen uh, death penalty cases, um, including a pair of back to back 2 a.m. 5 to 4 decisions uh, in July, allowing the first federal executions in 17 years to go forward. And what's interesting about the rise of the shadow docket is, I think, two things. First, we're seeing more of these cases than we've seen in the past. Um, and second, we're also seeing more divisiveness. Um, so just to put this into context, there have now been to this point five, uh, uh, sorry, um, 11 decisions on the shadow docket since last October, since the beginning of the current Supreme Court term, where we know the vote was five to four. There are only 12 argued cases all year where the total was five to four. And so I think what we're seeing is the court is doing more and more work through these unsigned summary orders that are either leaving lower court decisions in place while an appeal is pending, or that's putting them on hold while an appeal is pending. And I think that's an increasingly large part of any attempt to summarize the work of the Supreme Court. Um, all right, if we go back a bit though toward what the court actually decided in the big argued cases, I think one of the biggest headlines we saw this term, I think this was a common theme in many of the end of term summary pieces, was just how dominant of role Chief Justice John Roberts played this term. Um, in the 53 cases in which the court handed down decisions that were argued, um, the chief was in dissent twice. That's remarkable. Uh, and only once in a five to four case, the Oklahoma uh, tribal sovereignty case, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, and it wasn't just that he was always in the majority. The chief wrote an unusually high number of the major um, majority opinions this term. Um, in at least one case, his concurring opinion was the central opinion for, you know, that's going to matter going forward. And I just, I, you know, I am hard pressed to think of a single term in which a single justice had quite as much of an impact and was quite so central to the operations of the court, um, certainly since at least the 1930s and maybe even then, um, that this is just a remarkable centralization of power by the Chief Justice, who has become, you know, since Justice Kennedy's retirement, <coughs> excuse me, not just the Chief Justice, but also the median justice um, on almost every single issue that matters. So this really is the Roberts Court now, not just in name, um, but in function. And then on substance, I think there were two pretty interesting themes that emerged in these big decisions and argued cases from the term. Um, one is, except for religion and immigration, and that's a big except, um, we really did see the court tacking at least somewhat toward the middle. Um, what I mean by that is we really did see the Chief Justice, sometimes with Justice Gorsuch, sometimes with Justice Kavanaugh, joining with the progressive justices more than we might have expected going into the term. Um, not necessarily to hand down you know, long-term venerable new principles of progressive constitutional law, but at least to provide results that were not nearly the sort of um, wipeout losses that some progressives were fearing, um, that in some cases were actually affirmative wins, right, for progressives like DACA. So with the, again, with the exception of religion and immigration, and we'll talk about that, um, really a much more center of the road term for the court than we might have expected going in. Um, and that's also true when we talk about the court and President Trump, um, that in you know, what were by far the two biggest Trumpy cases the court has heard thus far, the Mazars case um, and the Vance case, um, the court did not go as far as I think it could have and should have, but I don't think there's any way to see those cases as anything other than pretty big losses for President Trump um, and losses in which uh, both of his appointees, uh, both Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, join at least in the bottom line um, and in one of them in the rationale. So, you know, a lot going on for a term in which the court decided the fewest cases um, in 160 years. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk briefly through some of the sort of the biggest rulings. Um, I would love to sort of, you know, we're not going to have time to go into super detail on each of them, but we can use the Q&A if you guys want to ask follow-up questions, you want to go into more detail, you're curious about the implications. Um, so I sort of have them broke out into categories, and I think the big three, um, the three most important uh, decisions the court handed down in argued cases this term are uh, the Title VII cases, uh, the DACA case, and the June medical abortion case. So I'm going to start there. 
So Title VII, um, case is captioned Bostock versus Clayton County. And the question is whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, um, which bans various forms of discrimination in the workplace, um, bars employers from discriminating, quote, based upon sex, unquote. What does that mean? Um, if an employer discriminates against someone because they are of a different sexual orientation, is that based upon sex? If an employer discriminates against someone because they, uh, out, they identify uh, in some kind of transgender status, is that based upon sex? And the Supreme Court in a six to three decision with Justice Gorsuch and Chief Justice Roberts joining the four more progressive justices answered both of those questions in the affirmative and said, yes, um, when an employer discriminates against you because you are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, the employer is discriminating against you based upon sex. Um, that's, you know, that's the natural meaning of the words. It may not necessarily have been within Congress's ambit and mindset in 1964, but the text says what it says. Um, and I think understandably, that's a huge win, right, for progressives. I mean, it's a pretty powerful and significant expansion of federal anti-discrimination law. I think there was some concern that the court was going to split the difference, that it had taken up both the sexual orientation and the transgender cases to hold that one was covered by Title VII and one wasn't. And in fact, the court goes all in and says, nope, all of this is sex discrimination. Um, I think there are two major sets of implications from this decision going in radically different directions. So major implication number one is um, Title VII is not the only federal statute that refers to discrimination based upon sex. And so the, you know, I think we're gonna see pretty quickly, and we are already seeing, um, challenges based on other statutes that prohibit various forms of sex-based discrimination, perhaps even equal protection claims under the 14th Amendment if it's a state, um, or the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment if it's the federal government, arguing that transgender and or sexual orientation-based discrimination <coughs> excuse me, counts, <coughs> counts as sex-based and therefore triggers um, at least intermediate scrutiny under the Constitution. And so I think we're going to see a raft of new litigation trying to not just solidify how Title VII changes as a result of this decision, but also whether other anti-discrimination claims now become viable that weren't before that will obviously have enormous ramifications um, for the rights of uh, individuals who identify as uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, etc. Just equalization across not just the workplace, but perhaps the, you know, the entire sphere of federal law. The other ramification, and this is where I think it gets trickier, is that Justice Gorsuch's majority opinion goes out of its way to say, of course, we're not dealing with circumstances in which employers might have legitimate religious justifications um, for discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation and or transgender status. And I think that's really where there's going to be a lot of pressure, as opposed to just, you know, fleshing out what this decision means in future cases. The tension, I think, that's going to happen after Bostock is when you have employers who say, you know, it's, it's a, an affront to my religious beliefs to have people in my workplace who identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender or whatever, um, and because it offends my religious beliefs, I can't be bound by Title VII. And that's where I think we're going to have some really tricky, messy, nasty litigation fights um, in the years to come and where this court might not be nearly as ready to jump on to that kind of claim. Um, I think it is telling that the four more progressive justices um, did not write separately um, to express concern about that carve out. Like, I think they know it's a big deal, but I think they didn't want to necessarily push Justice Gorsuch or Chief Justice Roberts um, into actually saying more than just we're not deciding that today. Um, and so that's exactly where, uh, just to take a question uh, from, the, from the chat box, that's where RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, comes into play because I think we're going to see arguments that insofar as employers are discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation or transgender status for religious reasons, their right to do so is protected by RIFRA, um, right? And that overrides anything in Title VII. 
Um, I don't know how those cases are going to come out. I just I think that's what Bostock tees up is, in general, federal law is going to protect against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or transgender status. But if there are specific justifications grounded in religion, Bostock does not prejudge that case. Um, and so I think that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, also in the chat box, there's a question about whether the scope of Title VII's religious exemption is at play. So <clears throat> yes, but in a different case, the Supreme Court decided this term. So um, if you'll bear with me, I'll get to the, the Title VII and the, the ministerial exemption um, a little bit later. Um, okay, so that's Bostock. Um, I think the second uh, huge, huge decision the court handed down this term was the DACA case um, under the caption Department of Homeland Security versus Regents of the University of California. And uh, this case um, came out, I think, much the way folks thought. It, I think everyone understood in this case all along that it was four to four in the chief. Um, and that's indeed how it came out. The chief ends up joining with the more progressive justices. And just to be clear, because there's a lot of, I think, misunderstanding about this out there. Um, the majority opinion says nothing about whether DACA itself is lawful or unlawful. It's caricatured as saying that it doesn't. Um, rather, what the majority opinion says um, is that the way the Trump administration rescinded DACA um, was arbitrary and capricious, was a violation of the Administrative Procedure Act because the justification that was initially provided for rescinding DACA just doesn't stand up to serious scrutiny. Um, as the Chief Justice explains, DACA really has two parts, right? There's the sort of benefits conferral part of DACA, but there's also the forbearance of deportation part of DACA. And all the Trump administration ever came up with a justification for was getting rid of the benefits piece of it. There was never a justification for rescinding the forbearance of removal part of the program. That's why the chief says it violates the APA strikes it down. Um, as the chief says, the government has to turn square corners um, when it is rescinding regulations. This is so, guys, so parallel to the Supreme Court's decision just last year in the census citizenship case, where the chief justice went out of his way to say, yes, in general, it's okay to ask a citizenship question on the census, but you guys just did such a bad job of doing it. Like, you did such a disingenuous job of trying to actually put this on the census that we can't allow you to basically lie to us, the court, about why you did something and still let you do it. So what does this mean for DACA? Um, boy, is that a headache. Um, so the short answer is it should mean that until there is further significant administrative action from the Trump administration, more on that in a minute, um, that the rescission of DACA is ineffective and so we return to the status quo where not only are current DACA recipients eligible for continued uh, applicability of the program, but where there's even the prospect of new applicants, where the program is still on the books. Um, the Department of Homeland Security uh, promulgated a memo a couple of weeks ago, taking a much narrower view, not, uh, to be clear, not trying to rescind DACA the right way, as the Supreme Court said it could, but rather um, taking a, a smaller view of what remains available today in light of the Supreme Court decision. Um, and that is currently being challenged a lot of different ways, um, but the lead lawsuit challenging that um, is in a federal district court in Maryland. Um, I believe it's under the caption Casa de Maryland versus Trump. Um, it's hard to keep all these cases straight. And just to sort of tie 14 threads together, in addition to challenging whether the new Trump DACA policy is consistent with the Supreme Court decision, this lawsuit is also challenging whether Chad Wolf, uh, nominally the acting Secretary of Homeland Security, is actually lawfully allowed, uh, lawfully appointed as the acting Secretary of Homeland Security. In, if he's not, the policy itself might be invalid. So um, more headaches, but also no um, immediate effort to just rescind DACA the right way. No effort to say, okay, we got it wrong, we're gonna do it right this time. Um, instead, it's much more sort of messy, nuanced questions about what the state of the program is today. Um, okay, and then the third major ruling, um, and one that got just a ton of headlines, um, was in a case called June Medical Services versus G. Um, this was the first big abortion case 
that the Supreme Court heard since Justice Kennedy's retirement in the summer of 2018. Um, and so the June medical case involved a Louisiana law that looked a heck of a lot like a Texas law that the Supreme Court with Justice Kennedy had struck down in 2016 in a case called Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstedt. Um, it's basically an admitting privileges requirement that any provider of abortions in the state of Louisiana has to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital. Um, the district court struck it down, largely following Whole Woman's Health. Um, the Fifth Circuit um, reversed on the ground that there were enough factual differences between how the law would impact abortion access on the ground in Louisiana and how the Texas law impacted abortion access in Texas. Um, and I think what's telling about the, the June medical case is um, we had a pretty good sense all along of where the Chief Justice was because he actually joined with the four more progressive justices in February of 2019 to stay the Fifth Circuit decision and basically to prevent the Louisiana law from ever going into effect, which I think most people took as a pretty powerful sign that if he ever voted on the merits, he would agree that the, that the Louisiana law was unconstitutional. Um, perhaps for that reason, in the Supreme Court, Louisiana really shifted its arguments um, where in addition to defending the law on its face, Louisiana really tried to attack whether abortion providers have standing, whether they're allowed to bring these kinds of cases in the first place on behalf of their patients. Um, and so I think one of the really important things about the June medical decision is the Supreme Court basically just ignored that um, and did not take up the invitation to revisit what's called third party standing, um, which means you know at least going forward, there's gonna be plenty of opportunity for providers in other states as states get more and more aggressive with their abortion restrictions um, to challenge these laws. On the merits, um, the court splits four to one to four. So there are five votes to strike down the Louisiana law. Chief Justice Roberts provides the fifth vote with the four progressives, but he doesn't join Justice Breyer's plurality opinion. Um, Justice Breyer, who had written the whole woman's health decision in 2016, writes again, largely to echo the themes of his 2016 decision to explain why the Louisiana law um, imposes an undue burden on women's access to a pre-viability abortion, um, why the Louisiana law, uh, the benefits of the law are radically outweighed by the burdens it imposes, um, and all sort of the, the same analysis from 2016. The Chief Justice writes a narrower concurrence in the judgment where he says that he, um, he's not disagreeing with the 2016 decision, but he doesn't think that every part of it is actually central. So in other words, the Chief Justice's uh, narrower concurring opinion really does try to narrow the 2016 decision, the whole woman's health analysis, which I think is critical because even though he ends up in the same place voting against the Louisiana law, this is probably gonna make it easier for him to switch sides in the next abortion case, where you have a case that is not quite so on all fours with the whole woman's health case, where the Supreme Court has a little more room to maneuver. I think the chief is leaving room for himself, right? To not look like he's being inconsistent. And we've already seen this play out in person. Um, well, in person. We've already seen it play out on the ground. Um, the Eighth Circuit recently um, reversed a district court injunction of, I believe it was an Arkansas abortion law, um, not because it thought the law was constitutional, but because the district court's analysis had been based on whole woman's health. And the circuit says, no, 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 the controlling rationale is no longer whole woman's health. The controlling rationale is Chief Justice Roberts' narrower concurring opinion in June Medical. So a big win at the moment, right, for um, pro-abortion groups, for pro-abortion interests, but also a very, I think, significant and potentially ominous sign um, of where the court's abortion jurisprudence will be going um, in the future. Not that I think Roe versus Wade is gonna be overruled tomorrow, but that the chief is gonna be perfectly willing to uphold state abortion restrictions that are more and more aggressive, as long as they don't look just like the ones the court struck down in 2016. Um, okay. So I think those were the, the sort of the, the three super huge, super big headlines. Um, and then there was the series of four, what we might call more, uh, uh, sorry, five, what we might call more structural 
like separation of power dish cases. Um, which I'm going to try to walk through pretty quickly because I, I don't know. I, I find these interesting, but a lot of people don't. Um, so, um, of course, off the top, we have the two uh, Trump financial records cases, Mazars and Vance. Um, so in Mazars, the Supreme Court holds by basically a five to two to two vote um, that Congress does have the power to issue subpoenas that even impact personal financial records of the president. Um, that the courts do have a role in enforcing those subpoenas, um, contrary to what the DC Circuit had just held in the Don McGahn case, but um, that the DC Circuit in upholding subpoenas that two different House committees had issued to Mazars for the president's financial records hadn't done the right analysis, hadn't given enough um, weight, enough respect to some of the countervailing considerations in cases implicating the president. Basically, the court punts. Um, and the punt, I think, is really revealing in two respects. One, the punt almost certainly means the case won't be resolved before Congress goes home in January. And I, I don't think I have to tell you guys, congressional subpoenas expire at the end of each Congress. Um, and so you know, it would be left for the next Congress um, to reissue the same subpoenas if this matter is not resolved by then. I think the Supreme Court's well aware of that timing um, and perhaps even to some degree counting on it. So the president loses, but maybe not like right away. Um, but the second big piece of this is, you know, a lot of folks reacted to the decision as a blow to Congress because the Supreme Court had imposed greater limits on congressional subpoenas than we'd ever seen before. And I just want to say, I don't share that view because I think those limits are pretty much um, drafting instructions, right? That as long as future congressional committees read that opinion, take the chief justice seriously, you know, take account of the four factors he says we have to look out for in such cases. Um, I actually see the decision as a huge win for Congress in the long term, not just because the subpoenas themselves are going to be valid if they meet those four criteria, but because the chief justice is saying, and we, the courts, will be here, we'll have your back, right? That if you meet these criteria, if the subpoenas are kosher, yes, it is properly our job as the courts to enforce them. Um, that may not help in the short term with Trump. I think that's actually really, really good in the long term for Congress um, compared to the way a lot of these cases have been going in the lower courts. So that's Mazars. Um, and then there's Vance. And Vance is weird. Um, and it's weird because it's just not that common that a sitting president would have ongoing business interests sufficient to subject him to the jurisdiction of a local prosecutor. Um, and yet this one does. And so Cyrus Vance, the district attorney in Manhattan, um, as part of a criminal investigation into wrongdoing by the Trump Foundation, by Trump businesses, by other Trump associates, issued subpoenas that look a lot like um, the subpoenas that at least two of the three congressional committees had issued in the Mazars case. Um, but unlike Mazars, where there was all this baggage about Congress's power to subpoena the president, in Vance, you have the settled precedent of the Nixon case, where the Supreme Court says a grand jury subpoena to a sitting president is perfectly appropriate in the right cases. Um, and so the Trump argument in Vance was actually a little bit different. The Trump argument in Vance was, but this is a state court, and presidents should be categorically immune from this kind of process in state courts. And that argument lost resoundingly. Uh, I mean, even though the actual vote in Vance was seven to two, neither of the dissenters, neither Justice Alito nor Justice Thomas, gave much credence, if any, right, to this absolute immunity claim the president had offered. Um, so instead, what the seven justices say is, we agree that this subpoena is valid on its face. And we agree that the president does not have a categorical basis for opposing it. But then, again, they punt a little bit. And they say, instead of therefore throwing this case out altogether, we leave it now for the president to go back to the district court and identify case-specific um, uh, justifications. Right? Uh, is there some particular reason? Is there a privilege that would be violated by compliance with the subpoena? Um, is there some interest that you haven't yet fully fleshed out that would be implicated? In other words, we've rejected your categorical arguments about the subpoena, 
are there any arguments specific to this subpoena that would warrant more consideration? So um, last week, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, sorry, the Supreme Court, the District Court, Judge Marrero, um, issued a 103-page opinion basically saying, nope, none of these arguments are any different, ruling against Trump. Um, Trump ran right to the Second Circuit, um, and the Second Circuit um, is a, a hearing oral argument on Trump's, whether, whether the, the trial court decision should be stayed, um, so I remember next Tuesday, September 1st. So this is moving quickly, unlike the Mazar's case with Congress, but also unlike Mazar's, Vance's subpoena doesn't expire in January. And so I think it is incredibly likely that Vance is eventually going to be able to enforce his subpoena um, against, I think it's what, it's Mazar's and Deutsche Bank um, for the president's financial records. Whether we'll ever see any of that is a different matter, depends to some degree on um, whether any of this comes out through the grand jury, um, but that's where I think Vance goes. Okay, um, of the five sort of structural cases, the third one um, is I think the one that has flown the most under the radar. This is the CFPB case, SALA law. Um, and so this is sort of the latest in the Supreme Court's, um, I say over fascination um, with the structure of executive branch agencies. Um, basically, the argument was that the CFPB was set up to be much like other independent agencies, the FTC, the FCC, the SEC commissions, um, but that all of those New Deal era commissions have multi-member heads, right? That the commission itself is made up of five, seven, nine members, and that the CFPB only has a single director. And the argument was that the single director structure raises constitutional concerns that having nine people or five people or even three people at the head of the commission don't raise. Um, I think most people understood this was a relatively transparent effort to encourage the Supreme Court to revisit even the independent commission model. Um, so the sort of landmark 1935 case called Humphrey's Executor, where a nine nothing Supreme Court rules in favor of these quasi independent agencies. Um, and what happens in say the law is um, a five four court resists the invitation to go after Humphrey's executor and just says, you know, we're not going to revisit Humphrey's executor. We're not going to revisit these old precedents, but we have enough doubt about those old precedents that anything that looks different from what we've upheld in the past is going to be presumptively unconstitutional. Um, and so even though the sort of net outcome here was simply to sever one provision of the CFPB statute to basically make the CFPB director um, removable at will instead of for cause. The implications of this, I think, are a really big deal. Because now the Supreme Court is saying, if Congress creates any kind of novel structure within the executive branch, something we haven't seen before, something we haven't blessed before, we're going to be skeptical of it just by default. Um, and, you know, I think if we had more time, I can try to get into why I think that's a really problematic line of thinking, um, why I think this whole sort of separation of powers line of cases um, is faulty at its premise. But for now, I think that's a big deal in thinking about what reforms might look like if and when there's a scenario where there's, again, you know, say one party democratic leadership um, in Congress and the White House. Um, this decision is a warning bell that Congress in trying to sort of structurally reform the executive branch to create more internal independence and accountability might run into some real problems once it starts doing things that are new. Um, so that's why I think it's a big deal. All right, the fourth of the big structural cases, um, this case goes down as big because of what it didn't decide. Um, and it would have been huge if it had gone the other way. This is the faithless elector cases. Um, so, a number of states have laws that create penalties. If you are a presidential elector um, and you don't cast your electoral vote for the person the state elected, um, believe it or not, not every state prohibits this practice. Um, there are a couple of examples of faithless electors in prior presidential elections. Um, and the question that the Supreme Court was presented with was whether um, laws that bind purportedly, that, that bar faithless electors from being faithless, that require electors to vote for whoever the state certifies as the winner of the popular vote in that state, whether those laws are unconstitutional. Um, and the Supreme Court, fortunately, said no, um, and unanimously, um, that states are allowed to bind 
their electors. Um, and indeed, imagine what it would mean if they couldn't, right? Then, you know, we could have this wonderful, huge election in November. It could be clear that the president actually lost, um, but if enough electors sort of, you know, cross the line, um, he'd win anyway. Um, that nightmare scenario was, I think, largely mooted, right, by what the Supreme Court decided in the faithful selective cases. All right, last but not least in the structural category of cases, um, and this is the problem with Zoom, is that, you know, I don't have your, your facial reactions and your body language to figure out if we're all sleeping yet. Um, but in the, in the big structural cases, I think the last one we ought to talk about is an immigration case called Thoracigium, um, DHS versus Thoracigium. Um, this was a case about expedited removal. Um, so expedited removal is something Congress created in 1996 um, for non-citizens who are um, arrested either shortly after entering the country, well, yeah, shortly after entering the country um, surreptitiously, not through a port of entry, um, and within a certain amount of time since they'd entered. So I think the rule for a while was 100 miles and 14 days. Um, the Trump administration has actually dramatically expanded that rule. Um, now I think it's two years and anywhere in the country, um, which is a pretty significant difference. Um, this case, though, started during the pre-Trump regime. And the question is whether if you are one of these non-citizens, you're undocumented, you're in the US without um, authorization, um, do you have a right to judicial review if your asylum application is denied? Because the whole point of expedited removal is to speed up the process. And the Ninth Circuit, the Federal Appeals Court on the West Coast, has said, yes, but if you have an asylum claim, even if you're otherwise subject to expedited removal, you're still entitled to a meaningful opportunity in court to challenge the factual and legal basis for the denial of your asylum claim. And the current removal proceeding is not a sufficient opportunity. Basically that the way the law was set up violated the constitution's suspension clause, the requirement of judicial review. The same provision the Supreme Court said in 2008 applies to non-citizen enemy combatants at Guantanamo. And the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision by Justice Alito says, nope. Um, and what the court says is the court does not go as far as some feared it would. The court does not say that in general, the suspension clause does not apply to undocumented immigrants. Um, which could have been a very dangerous step toward reducing constitutional protections for all undocumented immigrants. Rather, the court does something that is, I think, in some ways worse, which is the court says the suspension clause does not apply to challenges to removal orders, period. Um, right, so that you can use this, you can use habeas if you're being detained to challenge your detention. But if all you're trying to do is challenge the legal basis for your removal from the country, that is not detention in the classical sense, and therefore your right to challenge a removal order is not protected by the suspension clause. Um, and part of why that is a huge deal is because it means Congress could, in theory, um, radically streamline even what little judicial review currently exists for all non-citizens in all removal cases on the theory that if it's removal, it's not protected by habeas. Um, that's not where the law is today. The law actually provides relatively, I don't want to say generous, but at least relatively widely available judicial review um, for most folks, not next to removal. But that still could be a huge precedent for Congress to exploit in the future. Um, and then, totally unnecessarily, Justice Alito goes on to hold that non-citizens in that circumstance, undocumented immigrants subject to expedited removal, are also not protected by the due process clause. Um, which wasn't necessary, given that he already said there was nothing to do in the judicial proceeding, and could have huge implications, right, for other kinds of claims from undocumented immigrants, um, both in and outside of expedited removal, going forward. Um, indeed, the federal government just filed a cert petition, I think yesterday, um, in a case called DHS versus Padilla, where the government is challenging a Ninth Circuit decision about the rights of undocumented immigrants in a particular kind of immigration proceeding, on the ground that after this new decision, they're not protected by the due process clause. So, you know, I think this, this is good. It flew under the radar given everything else was going on, but this is actually a really significant decision for the constitutional rights or lack thereof of immigrants in general and undocumented immigrants in particular. Um, okay, so those are the structural cases. Um, I wanna sort of spend some time on religion. 
Um, but one other big sort of issue that we thought the court was going to grapple with this term and didn't was guns. Um, so the court had taken up this huge Second Amendment case out of New York called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, um, which was challenging a very, very broad New York State ban on uh, traveling intrastate with guns that you were otherwise legally entitled to possess. Um, but once the Supreme Court had granted cert, New York actually changed its law, um, probably to make this case go away. Um, not the first time that's ever happened, um, but this led to a whole fight over whether the case really was moot. And the Supreme Court, um, by a six to three vote, says, yes, it's moot, um, right? So uh, three justices actually dissent, right? From the notion that this case was moot, uh, Alito, um, Thomas, and Gorsuch. But the chief and Kavanaugh joined the progressives in saying, yes, there's nothing left to do. Kavanaugh then writes the separate concurrence where he says, but bring us more gun cases. We want more gun, you know, we're, don't take this as a sign that we don't want gun cases. Um, but then the court denied cert in the 10 pending Second Amendment cases they had. Um, and so I think what that might testify to is that there are four justices who want more gun cases, but there may not be five, uh, right? That the chief may not necessarily be ready for more gun cases. He may not be able to wait much longer though. So there was a huge case that I think flew under the radar a couple of weeks ago, the Ninth Circuit. Um, and just to, to put a little spin, I, I clerked on the Ninth Circuit. This is not the Ninth Circuit I clerked on. Um, the new Ninth Circuit struck down California's ban on large capacity magazines um, on the ground that it violates the Second Amendment. Um, that is going to be, it, it, unless the Ninth Circuit goes on bonk and reverses that decision, which it might, um, that's going to be a very hard case for the justices to turn away um, because there's now a split. Um, so, Steve, the, Steve, you said four, four wanted it, five didn't. Isn't four enough? So, I, so I'm sorry, Congressman. So I think four want another gun case. Um, four is enough in form, right? It only takes four to grant cert, but they're not going to grant cert if they're not sure about the chief, right? The, the last thing they want is to take another gun case and then have the chief, you know, um, not my word, wimp out on them. Um, so this actually, I mean, there's a remarkably candid set of commentary um, after this happened in, in May where a bunch of conservatives said, you know, were like, we're done with this court. They're not taking any of our gun cases. Um, to which I say, you guys, you know, you've got a solid majority on the Supreme Court for the first time since the 1930s, like something about gift horses and mouths. But um, so I think, you know, I think we will probably see more gun cases soon, but not this term, maybe not even in the next term. Um, okay, religion. So I think there were three major, major religion decisions. And the sort of the two big thematic points to say about all three of them is here is the conservative court being conservative. I mean, if there's one set of cases where we really see the new conservative majority doing things we might not have expected, um, you know, that's, um, it's this one. Um, so the, the three big cases, so Espinosa versus Montana Department of Revenue, um, this is about so-called Blaine amendments where the state constitution um, had basically, um, how do I say, um, prevented the state from providing funds to religious schools that were otherwise available to non-religious schools. Um, and so the question was whether the state constitutional provision was um, in violation of the free exercise clause by singling out religious schools for disfavorable treatment. Um, and to back up a second, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence for a long time has tried to sort of split the difference between free exercise on the one hand and establishment on the other, where um, on the one hand, you don't want states preferring religion, but on the other hand, you don't want states dispreferring religion, right? And so the idea is to sort of have states be neutral when it comes to religion. And the idea is that there's gray area between the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and states are entitled to deference in policing the gray area. That's where the Supreme Court had been for a long time. What is remarkable about Espinoza is the Espinoza court is saying, nope, there's no more gray area. Um, that unless it would violate the establishment clause, a state has to allow religious participation or else it will violate the free exercise clause, right? We're collapsing the gray zone. So that now 
the state basically, the Constitution is controlling the state's choices. You either have to allow the religious program in, or your reason for not doing it has to be that allowing them in would violate the Establishment Clause. Um, that's a big deal, um, because it means that there's going to be more and more of these cases where the burden is going to be on the state to show that the reason why we're not allowing access to this funding program for religious institutions is because we think we'd be establishing religion if we did. If that becomes the litmus test, more and more of these are going to fall. Um, and I think that's a big part of why Espinoza was five to four. Um, the second big religion case, Little Sisters of the Poor, this was the um, new Trump administration employer exemption from the ACA's contraceptive mandate. Um, this is a bit of a weird case because it's hyper narrow and it's hyper technical. But the basic gist is the Obama administration had already exempted religious employers from the ACA's contraceptive mandate. Um, the question is, what if we're not really a religious organization, um, but we do religious stuff, right? Like what if we're actually not, what if we don't necessarily have the, the same tax status, right? Or what if we are, what if it's our moral beliefs, not our religious beliefs, that's leading us to um, not want to participate in the contraceptive mandate? And the, Supreme, and the Trump administration says, yes, we're expanding the exemption to include religious and moral objections to contraception. Um, and the lower courts had struck down that rule. And the Supreme Court, by a 5-2 to two vote, 5-2-2, two, 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 with Breyer and Kagan concurring narrowly in the judgment, um, of, uh, uh, reversed. Um, I don't think this is quite as big a deal as Espinoza um, because it's not really radically changing any of the constitutional rules. It's just about what the administration is allowed to do as a matter of interpretive guidance under the Affordable Care Act. More on that in a minute. Um, but it's an interesting sign in both this case and the next one that Breyer and Kagan are actually willing to cross over um, in religion cases if they think they can exact some kind of narrower opinion out of it, right? If they think they can hold the court um, a little closer, keep the majority from going too far. And I think that's part of what's going on in Little Sisters. Um, and then there's Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, this is the ministerial except exemption case I referred to a bit earlier. Um, and basically the ministerial exemption, uh, the Supreme Court has long interpreted Title VII to just not apply at all um, to ministers, right? To the hiring of religious ministers. Um, religious groups are allowed to discriminate in the hiring of ministers in ways that we wouldn't allow them to discriminate, well, in ways that we wouldn't used to allow them to discriminate in the hiring of janitors. Uh, right, that's sort of the, the common distinction. Um, the court had been, I think, adopting a very functional approach to who counts as minister, who, who's on the minister side of the, ta of, of, the, of the ledger and who's on the janitor side of the ledger. Um, and the, basically the thing to say about Our Lady of Guadalupe is the court moves the line much closer to the janitors um, by basically saying um, employees who are centrally involved in religious instruction even if they themselves are not teaching religion. Um, and so in this case, there were two teachers. I think one was a science teacher, um, and one I think was an English teacher. I may be getting the second one wrong. And the court says, even though they're not teaching religion, right, they are part of the educational operation at a religious school. Ergo, they're covered by the ministerial exemption. Um, and this one, Breyer and Kagan sign on to without a narrower opinion. So, you know, this is where I think the court is going on religion, which is much more protection for at least some kinds of religious liberty claims. And this is why, if I can just sort of jump ahead for a second, I think one of the biggest cases the court is already sitting on for next term um, is also a religion case called Fult uh, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. Um, not to be confused, by the way, with Fulton versus City of Chicago. There are two different cases the court has next term. They're very different. Um, I've already made this mistake once. So Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, I don't want to get into the, the weeds of it, but the big picture question is whether the Supreme Court should revisit its 1990 decision in a case called Employment Division versus Smith. Um, and let me sort of explain why that's a huge deal. So in Employment Division versus Smith, that's the peyote case. Um, in Employment Division versus Smith, the Supreme Court says that government laws that just happen to burden religious practice do not violate the free exercise clause as long as they are secular in origin, right? And as long as they are neutrally applied. Um, and they don't even trigger heightened scrutiny. 
basically at all, it, as long as they're secular, non-discriminatory laws of general applicability, they don't violate the free exercise clause, even if they're not perfectly tailored. Um, and of course, what that means is there's a lot of room for governments to apply zoning rules to religious institutions, um, fire codes, right? Like things that aren't usually that controversial. Um, it has been a bugaboo of religious conservatives for years that Smith is wrongly decided, right? RIFRA, which we mentioned already, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was at least partially a response to Smith to try to create statutory protections to make up for the ones the Supreme Court wouldn't read in the Constitution. I think it's safe to say that if there are now five votes to overrule Smith, which is basically the question in Fulton, um, that would make even this term's religious cases pale in comparison. Because all of a sudden, tons, and I mean tons, of local, state, and federal regulations would become vulnerable to these kinds of free exercise objections. Um, so that's next term. Okay, um, two last little bits of, of cases from this term, and then let me finish the sort of preview of next term, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Um, so environmental law. Um, there were actually two really under the radar environmental law cases that the court decided this term. Um, one was the County of Maui case, uh, in, in environmental protection case out of Hawaii. One was the Atlantic Richfield Superfund case out of Montana. Um, Neither of these were like landmark rulings that are going to dramatically change the face of environmental law, but both were surprisingly progressive. Um, right? In County of Maui, the court actually did not take up the invitation to dramatically narrow the groundwater coverage of the EPA's rules. Um, and in Atlantic Richfield, um, the court refused to take up the invitation to cut off certain kinds of state tort suits that are trying to hold firms responsible for environmental pollution. And the thing these cases have in common is they're both six to three, and they're both with the chief and Kavanaugh joining the lefties. Um, so it's possible that environmental law is actually one area where the new conservative majority may not actually be solid, um, and where the chief and Kavanaugh, at least, are going to be, you know, more, um, this is how they're described by their critics, squishy um, on these issues. Um, and then last but not least, I think everyone's favorite case from the term um, is McGirt versus Oklahoma. Um, this is about uh, basically one third of Eastern Oklahoma. Um, and the question is whether um, one third of Eastern Oklahoma is actually still technically under the sovereign control of uh, the Creek Native American tribe, having never lawfully been deeded over, right, to the state of Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma had been fighting this for years. Um, right, McGirt is a criminal case where the whole argument is that the state could not try this guy criminally because of a federal statute called the Major Crimes Act, which requires jurisdiction to be exercised by the Native American reservation or by federal courts. And Justice Gorsuch, joining with the progressives to form a 5-4 majority, says, yep. Um, it's actually a really interesting opinion to read. Um, whatever else folks think about Justice Gorsuch, he has been consistently a champion of Native American rights um, in his time on the federal, federal bench, both the Tenth Circuit and the Supreme Court. Um, and I think, you know, this case reads like that, you know, reads in that direction. The odd thing is now this creates all this crazy litigation about, so who's in charge of, say, civil jurisdiction in eastern Oklahoma? What about mineral rights? What about taxes? Um, and so for the Oklahomans in the crowd, um, this case is a huge headache, and for everybody else, it's a fascinating piece of history and um, an interesting moment of redemption, I think, for um, a long-running gripe between a tribe and the federal government. All right, um, I already mentioned Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, looking ahead to next term. The other two huge cases I want to flag, um, one obviously is the ACA case, um, now captioned California versus Texas. And if that's not a sign of the times, I don't know what is. Um, so this is the Texas lawsuit trying to get the entire Affordable Care Act thrown out again. Um, the basic premise of the lawsuit is that when Congress zeroed out the individual mandate in President Trump's, I guess, what, 2017 tax bill, um, it took away the analytical justification for the individual mandate. But that's really just the appetizer, um, because if there's no mandate, then there's no mandate. The real point of the litigation is to try to use the unconstitutionality of the now zeroed out individual mandate to justify throwing out the entire statute, basically a, a, an, an inseverability argument. Um, 
And the district court bought it. Um, and the Fifth Circuit mostly bought it, right? And now we're in the Supreme Court. And just the two things I'll say about this. First, the court has scheduled argument for November 10th. So one week after the election, um, that's not a coincidence. Um, but two, um, I mentioned the uh, CFPB case, sale of law. So we focus mostly on the unconstitutionality of the single director structure, but the rest of the opinion in sale of law um, was actually a seven to two holding. Um, it was um, the four progressives, Chief Justice Roberts um, and Justices um, Kavanaugh, and I think, I have to go back and check, I think Gorsuch, um, on basically not just why that provision was severable, but on severability more generally. Um, it is really hard to read the analysis about severability in the CFPB case and not see a really big opinion coming that actually doesn't throw out the whole ACA, right? Like, I, I think if, if we get to the merits, if the case isn't somehow mooted by the time the Supreme Court decides it, um, I think Chief Justice Roberts will, yes, for the third time, vote to save the ACA. Um, and then last but not least, there is the Department of Justice versus the House Committee on the Judiciary, um, a case probably near and dear to at least some of your hearts. This is the um, Mueller grand jury materials case. And what I think is especially galling about what the Supreme Court did with this case is there were various efforts to expedite the Supreme Court's review. Um, the court refused all those efforts to expedite um, and instead just granted cert and set it for general, you know, set it on the calendar for whenever. So that means that the earliest this case could be argued is December of this year, and the dispute expires January 3rd when this Congress goes home. Um, so the court basically granted this case in order to kill it, um, which you know, I think raises a whole other set of questions about how the court manipulates the timing of its docket, as it has done a number of times recently, to try to avoid decisions in some of these cases. Um, all right, I have been talking a lot. Um, and you have been very patient. So Congressman, why don't I sort of stop there for a moment and throw it open to, to questions. Um, okay, uh, if people have uh, questions, if you will use the um, raise hand function and while we're looking for um, uh, people to raise their hands, back to the uh, Title VII case on sex, there are a number of issues on that. One of which is where is legislative intent along things because obviously when it was written, it was the legislative intent was not to include um, sexual orientation or transgender, but the words are clear. The words mean what they mean. Um, as we draft um, legislation, uh, how, how much is legislative intent gonna matter going forward? Um, so I think, I think legislative intent and congressman is still going to matter um, more than not at all, um, right? That's the like I, I still think it is really incumbent upon Congress to build a record to support what it's doing when it's passing legislation. But you know what what the what the Title VII case drives home is that this is a court that is going to be so heavily committed to textualism as they define it um, that you know even the most sort of accidentally clear text is gonna override clear legislative intent to the contrary, right? So, so basically that like, you know, I still think it is really important for Congress to build the record, to, to produce the reports, to have the testimony. But, you know, it's not gonna matter if the language is um, either one of two things, either clear in a different direction, right? Or, in, or, or not malleable enough to make reference to the legislative record relevant. One of the concerns on um, um, one of the concerns of um, um, on the case is whether or not it's decided on statutory or constitutional basis. If you get the right to essentially override the Civil Rights Acts because you have strongly held beliefs on religion on, on on sex, you have white nationalists. You have people with national uh, national origin, uh, strongly held beliefs. If you're running a restaurant, for example, that you don't want those people in your restaurant and you feel very strongly about it from a religious perspective. Um, if it's decided under RIFRA, we can fix that with the Do No Harm Act. 
but if it's um, decided by the Constitution, you can't fix, you can't cure a constitutional imperfection with a statute. Can you say a little bit about um, where you think, um, and, and you, the little gap there where they said we're not deciding the religious liberty part of it. Um, can you give us a little guidance on what we should, could, might expect on whether or not future cases like that, and I guess the religious um, um, healthcare cases are gonna be decided by, by statute or by constitution? So, I mean, I think the, I, I, I have two sort of different, they're, they're related thoughts, but they're just different. So let me, let me sort of take them in turn. So first, I think the big thing to watch out for in the short term is the Fulton case, because, you know, as you say, Congressman, it's a big difference between whether you're deciding these issues just based on RIFRA, right, or whether you're deciding them based on what the free exercise clause is interpreted to require. And, you know, this is why I think Fulton just, you know, absolutely dwarfs the rest of these cases when it comes to importance. Because if the court does overturn Smith and does read in a much more aggressive principle into the free exercise clause, um, that's going to really tie Congress's hands, um, right? In about so it, 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 would, it, would, it would put a place in jeopardy the entire '64 Civil Rights Act. Because if you have, I mean, if you if you're running a business, they're going to tell people we don't want your business. That's obviously a strongly held belief. Yeah. Uh, so, I, mean, I, 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 I guess I, I would say it, it may not go, it, may, it, may, it will place in, it, it will make every single claim under the 64 Act subject to litigation about whether you had a genuine, a bona fide religious belief, um, which is part of why I can't imagine the court going there because it's just, you know, the courts are going to spend years testing, testing the, the, the faith of the, of the, of the litigants. Um, if it's statutory, right, if it's, if it's all focused on sort of interpretations of the intersection between Title VII and RIFRA, um, then of course, you know, I think the obvious answer there is for Congress to, to, pay out, to, to, to pair back RIFRA, um, right? To sort of, to clarify that, you know, these are the kinds of claims, that, this is how we think Title VII and RIFRA should intersect. Um, what is the court gonna do until and unless Congress does that? I mean, I'll just say like, for, for as much as some of us may be surprised by where Chief Justice Roberts was on many of the terms big cases, he is remarkably consistent on religion. Um, and he is remarkably protective of religion. And so I am, I am to, to, to sort of show my biases, nervous, right, about what a, a RIFRA heavy regime looks like um, going forward in this context. Well, we have, there's legislation pending, we call it the Do No Harm Act, which right. says basically you can, ex you can have all the exercise, your freedom of religion until such time you're doing somebody harm. They have a right to come to the restaurant you can't, your, your views don't override that right. And I think the Do No Harm Act makes a lot of sense in a world in which this is all statutory, but in a world in which Fulton overrules Smith, the Do No Harm Act might raise constitutional problems all its own. Um, and Ver I, um, I hope I'm, is it Veronica? Is that in the chat? I hope I'm- Ver I hope Vernique. I'm, Vernique. Oh, oh, Vernique, I'm sorry. Um, so Vernique, I think, I think that gets to most of the question, but just to answer the question more specifically, um, so I do think, right, that yes, the statutory religious exemption under Title VII is still out there and it's still gonna have to be litigated beyond the ministerial exemption. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to dismiss that as quickly as I think I did. Um, and so I think there's gonna be litigation going forward about the scope of that particular statutory exemption. I'll just say that my admittedly not well-formed understanding is that that exemption has historically been interpreted fairly narrowly and fairly specifically. Um, you know, whether there's going to be more pressure now in the courts to expand that exemption, again, I think dovetails with the broader question about um, um, Fulton and what happens to Smith versus, to, to employment division versus Smith. On the, um, on the right to abortion, how alive is the basic fundamental right to abortion? Uh, depends on the state. Um, it's, it's doing fine in blue states and it's, it's, you know, under serious assault in red states. Um, well, how's it in the Supreme Court? So, cause that would, that would activate that question. I think, I think that it is for the moment, right? I don't think that the court is in, is in much of a different place than it was, um, before whole woman's health four years ago. Right. So, so for the moment, I think we're back to like the Supreme Court circa 2010 on the board.
push in. Um, but I think the Chief Justice is signaling quite loudly that although he may not be willing to overturn Roe, he is willing to uphold state restrictions that are more aggressive than what we've seen before. Um, so, you know, fetal heartbeat laws, for example, which the Supreme Court has never considered, um, that ban abortions once you can detect a fetal heartbeat. Um, you know, it, that could be a big, a big line of, of, of debate. Um, some of the, um, like the, the fetal remains provisions we're seeing in some of these state laws now. So, you know, I think for the moment, the law is at least sort of stable in the Supreme Court, but there's going to be a ton of pressure coming from states we can predict um, and lower court judges appointed by this president um, on the Supreme Court to sort of take another one of these cases. And when, the, when, when the next case gets there, and it's not quite so obviously an effort to get around this recent Supreme Court decision, I think the Chief Justice is signaling that he'll be receptive. Anything on voting rights or education coming up? Not, uh, so, so let me say, not on the regular docket, right? But we saw, I mean, we saw the Wisconsin um, RNC, DNC case on the shadow docket. Um, we saw the- Let me tell you that, that, that Wisconsin, did you see the clip of the Speaker of the House of Wisconsin standing at a polling place decked out in total head to toe and protective equipment, protective, uh, personal protective equipment. Hard to miss. Speaking through a mask, explaining to the reporter at a polling place how safe it is to vote. <laughs> um, so the, the, I, I, the point is to say the Wisconsin case was on the shadow docket. The Florida felon pay to vote case, which is a huge deal, right, was on the shadow docket. And so, you know, I think we're going to get a whole raft of these cases between now and November that the court only is able to deal with through these summary you know, one sentence orders. Um, and in that context, the court has been very consistent and consistently hostile to anything expanding the franchise. Um, and so that's, you know, I think a real concern to keep an eye on as we head toward the election in November. Anything in education? Not really. Um, you know, this administration has been so, I think, um, uh, dilatory on that, that there ha I mean, the, there was the, um, the only thing I can think of is there was the, there was the transgender, um, oh gosh, the, the, I thought the Department of Education had some kind of new transgender guidance um, that is now deeply vulnerable and I think was, has already been enjoined um, after and in light of Bostock. Um, but that's, that's still in the lower courts. That's not, I think, anywhere near the Supreme Court. Are there any other questions? Let me check the chat box. If, you, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and we're happy to unmute you. Or if you'd like to, to type it in the chat box, we can answer your questions that way as well. Doesn't look like there are any other questions. Uh, Steve, uh, anything, uh, any closing comments? Anything we need to look out for coming up? And I just say, you know, I, I just, I, I, the, the thing I encourage folks to think about the most is that the Supreme Court does a heck of a lot of work, even when it's not handing down these big, huge opinions that we get at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so, you know, if you are a court watcher, if you're interested in what the court's doing, pay as much attention to what it's doing on the order side of the, of the ledger and with these, these late night rulings that don't have a lot of analysis attached to them um, as the big rulings that we get in May and June each year. And that would include death. Yep, penalty yep. cases. That's what Absolutely. Those it, includes, come in. it includes both state and federal death penalty cases. We might be getting another federal death penalty case this week. Um, it includes elections. Um, we had a bunch of COVID cases that have gotten to the Supreme Court that way. And so that's where I would just say, you know, um, the court is acting even when it's not acting. And that's, you know, it's just as big a part of its docket these days as, as the stuff we usually pay this much attention to. It looks like we have uh, two more questions. Veronique, if you'd like to ask your question. Renick, you got to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you know. Apologies. I, um, uh, I, I'm just following up on a question from the chat box, and, and this was uh, the question of the fact that given that RIFRA is considered a super statute, and um, the doors have been opened to permit um, the sincerely held religious belief 
to um, turn uh, or, or examine a policy with regard to, uh, on the basis of sex, uh, what is the professor's uh, take on whether or not we can extend that logical conclusion to undermining the protection of race um, as a protected class under Title VII and other aspects of the Civil Rights Act? Um, it, it's a great question. I, I don't have a great answer other than to say that there's been no suggestion from the court thus far that its willingness to allow religion to be used as a wedge against, you know, LGBT um, equality would also allow this court right today would also extend to race. And I can think of at least, you know, maybe one and a half of the conservative justices who would be very resistant to that. So I, it's definitely a concern. It's something we should be very on the watch for. But at least so far, I haven't seen any reason to believe that that's a natural progression. And I think, Kara, you had a question? Um, yeah, I just, in, if you have a couple minutes, I would just be interested and cur curious to hear your take on kind of what to look out for with the ACA Texas case. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the se separability is the ball game. And, you know, the sort of whatever the court wants to say about the individual mandate, you know, if they, if there are five votes to say, since it's no longer a penalty, it can't be upheld, um, is there any real support from, you know, the chief and Kavanaugh especially for the notion that the whole statute has to fall? Because um, I really think that's going to be the ball game. And, you know, given where they were in the CFPB case, I'd be very surprised if they were, but that's what I'll be listening for in the argument is just everything is about like, okay, why does the rest of the statute have to fall if we just say this one little provision, you know, comes out? That's, I think that's where, that's where the meat's gonna be. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Carolyn? This is, this is Veronique. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Veronique, go ahead. Okay, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, one more question. Um, are there any cases that um, you're following that may be related to the Janice v. Ask Me case? Um, so the, there are, there's a couple of cases in the lower courts um, about whether compulsory bar dues for lawyers um, run into constitutional problems in light of Janice and um, the rejection of, 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 of agency fees for, for uh, public sector unions. Um, those really haven't gotten to the court of appeals level yet. And so, you know, I, I think it's, we're probably at least a year and a half to two years away from those getting in the Supreme Court. And I'm not even sure they get to the Supreme Court unless there's really a division in the lower court. So, you know, I'm sort of loosely keeping an eye on that, but it's not, I don't think it's, I don't think it's quite yet on the radar for the Supreme Court in the next 12 to 18 months. And the final and, question, Carolyn Ronas, Carolyn? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the, you've answered everything um, very well. The only question I have is actually on a case that you didn't cover, and maybe that's better to take it offline, but it's the Comcast case and how that would affect, how that impacts the gross decision and, and um, modifying the Protecting Older Workers Against Discrimination Act going forward. And, and since you didn't cover that case, maybe that's something we can do offline. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chat offline. The only thing I'll say, so the Comcast case, part of why I didn't cover it is because I think, you know, it was, it was a potentially huge case where the ultimate decision was narrow enough um, mm -hmm. that I think the impact, you know, how big a deal it is remains to be seen, right? That there, there was a real concern that the justices were going to tear a heart out of, um, you know, 1981 claims. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, what you got instead was a very careful opinion by Justice Ginsburg um, that found a way to basically tell the Ninth Circuit to try again without meaningfully changing the standard. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I, I'm happy to talk further about this offline. I, I just, I, I'm not yet convinced that the Comcast decision is going to really move the doctrine, um, either in that case or beyond the particular circumstances of that case. Um, I really think the, the courts letting the lower courts sort of fight that one out first. The, my concern was when you, when you, you know, the arguments that the justices didn't seem to remember the opinion that right. they had been involved in previously, and that Indeed. causes me concern going forward with that case, you know, especially if you do something with um, the Protecting Older Workers Against Discrimination Act and enforcement on that. So, Ken, I, I agree that I agree that I don't trust the court in this area at all. Um, yeah. I, I just think that that. Um, 
legislation like the like the pending bill, I think, would be a really useful step forward because it would give the court a blank slate to sort of, you know, get away get, get away from the sort of doctrinal and jurisprudential baggage. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think Ginsburg went out of her way to sort of not put too heavy of a thumb on the scale of what the court was going to say about 1981. Not, I think, deliberately to give you guys more room to maneuver, but in a way that does give you guys more room to maneuver. Great. I may be reaching out to you then next term. Please, you know where to find me. Yeah, thanks. Good. Well, Steve, I think that's it. And I want to thank you for being with us today. We've got to do it again. Uh, it's been a long time and uh, we'll stay in touch and uh, we encourage everybody. Do you have, a, it's just one podcast you've got? Yeah, so the National Security Law Podcast, you can also, um, um, if you don't mind my, my slight sort of uh, Twitter rantings and my wife and I yelling at each other, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, that's a good place to keep up with what I'm up to. Um, my handle's in my picture, but it's at Steve underscore Vladek. Um, I, I'm on Twitter too much, but you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Good. Well, not, not review anyway. <laughs> well, thank you. well, thank you very much for being with us. This concludes the uh, briefing and we'll get together after the, um, um, after the court starts up again and uh, do um, a kind of a mid-year thing. And it's, uh, so it's good to see you again, Steve, and keep up Likewise. the good work. I look forward to it. Thanks, Congressman. Great to see you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.